Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Mark Plaster, Senior Executive Editor of Emergency Physicians Monthly, and you're listening to EP Talk, the place where ER docs come to talk about things that are important to us. And our guests this uh, today uh, are Dr. Jay Matthews, uh, an interventional cardiologist and endovascular specialist and the director of the cath lab at uh, Manatee Memorial Hospital and also Dr. Teresa Raw, uh, the director of the emergency department at Manatee. And uh, I want to welcome both of you. Uh, both of you are long years of experience in your respective fields. And, and uh, the, the topic today is going to be very uh, important, to tying those two together. So uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're talking today uh, about uh, an issue that's affecting us uh, pretty severely in emergency medicine, certainly. Uh, and that is uh, the, uh, the hypercoagulability and the coagulation problems that are related to uh, COVID. I, I wanna just kind of open it up and, and talk about uh, the kinds of things that uh, we're seeing in the emergency department related to COVID uh, and the hypercoagulability. Uh, Dr. Rao, uh, can you comment on that? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, clearly, as you stated, we're seeing a significant increase in our COVID-19 patients. And as time goes on into this pandemic, we're learning more and more of the, the potential fallouts or side effects that we didn't initially anticipate. And primarily what we're talking about today is an increase in clotting, whether that be venous or arterial. Um, as you know, we see a lot of patients that present with leg pain, and now we yeah. have a heightened sense of looking for things such as DVT. Um, yeah. In addition to that, shortness of breath isn't just COVID, it may be the side effects of a pulmonary embolism that we're seeing. So although the signs and symptoms haven't changed, sometimes what we're looking for is a little bit, we, we broadened our sense of what we're looking for or widened our scope, so to speak. So where we used to use the strict Wells criteria for DVT, we now add COVID as one of those risk factors. Right, exactly. And what we're typically seeing uh, for the patients that coming into the emergency department is those that are really sick, the diagnosis may be more simple or readily apparent. What we really have to focus on are those patients that come in that may not be quite so sick and may not require hospitalization for the COVID itself, but yet for the side effects of that, and that being the, the clots that we're talking about today. Yeah, I've actually, uh, it, it's it's a dual diagnosis, and I, I think sometimes we concentrate on the COVID, and if the patient's uh, not particularly ill from that, their pulse ox is not too bad, we expect it in the low 90s, okay? We'll, we uh, we expect we we let that go um and send the you know and have a tendency to kind of send them home and, and in the past if somebody had uh in the low 90s we would think oh my it, it we that must be a, a dvt that must be a pe and uh and it's easy to to slide uh, uh to slide a patient out and then not really think about it so it's ex absolutely right so how does that change your protocol i mean how 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 i know how does that how do you think about it what do you do differently well, it's, what's interesting, Mark, we used to think that anybody who had an elevated D-dimer automatically went to a CT angiogram. So, <laughs> you know, now... Everybody has an elevated D-dimer now. <laughs> right. So, so now it's been an interesting um, kind of conundrum of which patients do you actually want to expose to the radiation and the, the iodine from it for a CT angio um, in those patients that you think are okay. So, So we've really basically kind of provided a lot of information to our providers. and Everybody has their own little gestalt on that. Yeah. But primarily what it's done is by increasing our heightened sense of this is we probably have increased the number of CT angiograms. But more importantly is what do we do when we have a positive? And yeah. we're very fortunate that we have a very close relationship with our cardiology team, in particular our invasive cardiologist. So it's any type of time we have a significant pulmonary embolism, we're contacting our cardiologist, our invasive cardiologist immediately, uh, oftentimes by text or by phone call, just to ask for their opinion so that we can determine if we have earlier intervention. Uh, when it comes to DVT, uh, anybody who has a DVT below the knee, we're still pretty much sending home on oral anticoagulants. But anything above the knee, our first phone call actually is really to the interventionalist, even over the primary care physician, to determine if thrombectomy, a more invasive uh, protocol, would be helpful for this patient as opposed to the typical heparin and put them back in the hospital. It's an interesting uh, approach to the PE patient, DVT patient, because 
uh, you all have the access to interventional cardi cardiology, uh, particularly with uh, Dr. Matthews. Tell us how that interfaces a little bit. Well, it's actually made the outcomes for the patient significantly better, and truthfully, it's made the, the job of as an ER physician much easier. Um, as you know, we're kind of disposition specialist, and rather than just admitting the patient to the hospital, uh, we now have the opportunity to have immediate contact with the interventional radiologist. So when we do find that patient, uh, let's take PE as an example, uh, who presents, it's moderately ill, maybe they have right heart strain on their, their CTA, and they look rather ill, I can immediately contact the interventional cardiologist who has access to look at the CT angiogram, and we can make a determination if that patient is a candidate for just the standard heparin therapy, or if they're able to go down to our cardiac catheterization lab for a thrombectomy or some of the other uh, fancy things that Dr. Matthews is able to do to make their outcomes significantly better. Uh, that also pertains to the DVT patient. Um, as you know, in the past, we just would heparinize those patients and put them in the hospital that had significant DVTs uh, and or just send the patient home that had a DVT below the knee. And now we've got other options that might make the patient's long-term outcome significantly better. So that's where uh, Dr. Matthews uh, comes in. Jay, it, it tell us a little bit about uh, your work with as an endovascular specialist uh, how, and what that looks like from your perspective. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, um, just uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm a consultant for uh, Penumbra on uh, venous therapies and whatnot too. So I'll be talking a little bit about some of their technology as well. But mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, this program, I'm, I'm also the director of the PERT initiative. So that's the uh, pulmonary embolism uh, response team. And uh, you know, we're trying to find better ways to make this process more efficient so that there's not a lot of you know, uh, you know, jumping around and delay in therapy. So to try to codify this and try to get, come up with a good algorithm. And, and what Teresa is talking about, you know, is uh, essentially an offshoot of what we had done previously for uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. So we were always trying to get the times down and try to make the process very smooth so that there's no question in terms of what's going to be done for that patient. And we're trying to do something similar in the P space and into a, a certain point, the point, the DVT space as well. Obviously, uh, with with DVT, um, you know, you have a little bit more time. You know, patients with uh, with uh, DVT, uh, uh, you know, have up to about two weeks from initial onset of their symptoms, where that clot is still fairly acute, and then you can actually offer some, uh, 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 you know, very uh, good endovascular therapies. Once it gets a little bit beyond that, then it becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, with COVID specifically, uh, you know, the clots are very different. Uh, they're a lot more uh, sticky. Uh, there's obviously a significant clot burden as well, too. So uh, early therapy, I think, in COVID patients is really important. So trying to do something sooner than later is, is very key. Uh, with PE, of course, uh, we're trying to push the concept that early therapy is important because many of these patients, especially the COVID patients, can be unstable. And uh, early therapy uh, uh, is, is, is key to, I think, success and resolution of symptoms and potentially even uh, mitigating some of the mortality. You know, we have some mortality numbers for patients with regular uh, PE without uh, comorbid uh, uh, COVID, but add in the COVID diagnosis, I think the mortality probably will go up significantly. And with just regular PE, we know that at three months, the, the death rates are, you know, can be even as high as 30%. So, uh, you know, uh, with COVID added in there too, we think that that risk is potentially even higher. So early therapy uh, for PE, I think, is is key. And we do offer, obviously, these endovascular therapies where we can potentially take these patients from the emergency department to the, to the cath lab and, and extract out their clots pretty readily and have on-table uh, uh, reduction uh, in, their, in their symptoms. So patients can, who are on 100% oxygen can get, on, can get off oxygen very quickly. Uh, patients that have a significant pulmonary hypertension as a result of the clot burden, we can potentially affect change immediately on the table and get improved results. You know, <clears throat> this represents a really a paradigm uh, shift uh, for emergency physicians because as uh, uh, Dr. Raw was uh, speaking about earlier, uh, we've been uh, kind of trained to uh, anticoagulate uh, uh, emboli and, uh, and that's it. You know, and uh, it's it's kind of, you're exactly right. It's it's a uh, it's a shift in mentality because that's what we did initially with heart attacks with MIs, 
and and now everything is it moved to uh, you know uh, the cardiac cath lab, and and the fact that you even have a, a pulmonary embolism response team is uh, we 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 have always said time is muscle when we're related to heart, and it was time is brain when we're related to stroke. Well, now we're looking at time is is lung, and uh, as it relates to uh, it, obviously life as well. If, uh, and we've only thought of uh, using thrombectomies uh, in like saddle emboli and things that were life-threatening, but you're actually suggesting that uh, we should rethink this and that maybe uh, catheterization and thrombectomy and uh, clot removal is should be more widely available. Is that, am I understanding that? Yeah, I mean, the reality is that in many institutions around the country, even thrombectomy for saddle pulmonary emboli, that's not even happening. So you have a patient uh, who presents and they have saddle PE, they're just getting IV heparin. And yep. we know that heparin does not uh, do anything for existing clot. It just helps prevent clot propagation. So yep. you're re completely reliant upon the body's natural fibrinolytic mechanism to dissolve that clot. And we know that with that much clot burden, it can actually uh, take a very long time and potentially never. I mean, you'll have these patients will have huge clots stuck in there for, for months to years. Uh, that will essentially never go away because it was never addressed up front. So uh, that's why, you know, it's very important to uh, 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 address this. And it's not just the saddle PEs. You know, we have uh, patients with uh, uh, submassive PE, uh, and you can see that they have RV strain by CT or echo. Uh, they may have serologic markers like pro BMP and troponin levels that are elevated, uh, EKG signs of strain. And, and, and maybe their symptoms are not that impressive, but by, by virtue of the fact that they have strain, you know, these, some of these patients will potentially benefit uh, from therapy from the studies that have been done. In fact, most of the studies that have been done have all been done in submassive patients. So we improve uh, just, uh, you know, from an imaging perspective, the, the signs of RV strain, but these patients have rapid resolution of symptoms, reduced uh, uh, length of stay in the hospital, uh, you know, these patients, uh, you know, I think become much less sick after initial therapy. And as the therapies are very safe with very uh, low risk of mortality, low risk of systemic bleeding, especially with the mechanical thrombectomy solutions, like, for example, with the Lightning 12 system that we use, um, you, know, what, you know, we find that um, these patients are, are just doing much better overall than what we did in the past, because our, our previous solution wasn't great, obviously, which was just a do IV anticoagulation. And what's yeah. also interesting too is that some of these patients with massive PE as well too, now we're actually even approaching those patients as well. In the past, you should just treat them with uh, systemic lysis at bedside. But if they're stable enough, you can bring them to the cath lab, meaning that even if they're on vasopressors or they're bradycardic, so really hypoxemic, even if they're potentially intubated, we can still potentially treat those patients and get them out of that extremis and potentially change their outcomes. You were mentioning the the uh, technology that uh, you're working with, uh, with with Penumbra, which is the Lightning 12 system. And tell me a little bit more about that. Obviously, we don't we won't be using that in the emergency department, but it's uh, it's fascinating to understand what you're actually doing uh, and the technology that that has developed uh, around it. Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I use a lot of different technologies, but um, you know, I'm always trying to find technologies that uh, potentially make our process more efficient and safe at the same time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it, the Lightning 12 system is an interesting uh, um, technology, and it combines several concepts together. One being uh, powered aspiration, uh, the other being a, a large bore catheter to get clot out, and also finally a way of uh, mitigating blood loss, and that's the lightning uh, technology, and offers something they call intelligent aspiration. Essentially, uh, this device uh, allows us to take essentially a large straw or large catheter, put it right up to the clot, and if it detects that the clot's there, it will actually start aspirating. But if there's open vessel, it's not going to uh, aspirate that blood. And so by doing that, it really translates to uh, a significant uh, uh, blood loss savings in comparison to the technologies in the past. So uh, it's a way to potentially uh, really mi mitigate potential for blood loss when you take a large catheter and essentially put it on near pure vacuum suction and, uh, and at the same time uh, have effective uh, uh, thrombus removal as well too with a very atraumatic uh, large bore catheter. 
I, uh, in preparation for this um, podcast, I did some research on the Lightning 12 system, and I was fascinated uh, uh, by, I, I frankly was not aware of the uh, blood loss issue that you guys face in the cath lab. And, and of course, it makes sense, but it, it was just something I wasn't aware of. And uh, when uh, it was explained, I thought, well, that's that makes perfect sense. And uh, and also it, uh, it has a, a lighter impact on the patient. Uh, so that'd be fantastic. I want to go back to Dr. Raw and um, because this is now the the interaction between the ER and the interventional cardiologist, uh, the endovascular specialist now is as again changed uh, our relationship. Uh, you were mentioning that it used to be the first call was to uh, the hospitalist or the the family doctor or whoever's going to handle the patient in in the, on the floor. But now uh, it, it's it's just like uh, we're uh, getting when we're prepping the the cath lab for the with the cath team. So uh, tell me a little bit about your process in the emergency department and how that uh, how you smooth that out and how you develop that uh, at Manatee. Well, I think that's actually an awesome story to tell. Um, we're very fortunate that we have such an amazing close relationship with the interventional cardiologist. And I think some of that occurs because number one, on our chest pain committee uh, and these other uh, intensive care and PERT teams, we have physician representative outside of just myself as a medical director and outside of Jay as just the director of his program. So we're able to have the opportunity to firsthand educate all of our doctors and have that opportunity for them to participate on these teams. So I think that's number one important. The second thing is the ease of, of speaking with the interventional cardiologist. Sometimes we would find that intimidating because we may propose a certain method of, of treatment for the patient and they may come back and say that they have something that, different that they can offer. And hence that's the reason why we make that our first phone call because not all community physicians are, are knowledgeable of these type of things that are available for their patient. So it makes it a better sell for me to talk with the uh, primary care physician after I've spoken and developed a plan with the cardiologist because we know that that's gonna be the best plan. And oftentimes we're actually then able to educate the primary care physicians on these newer technologies, um, heighten their sense of awareness of these, these disease processes and the treatments for them. So um, I, I feel very blessed and I would hope that every ER doctor in the country has the opportunity to work with somebody like Dr. Matthews, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> the, the next thing has to, to, to help us is after the procedure, it is not uncommon that they're sending us pictures of the clots that they, they pulled out and uh, you know, makes it really feel good about making a difference for that patient. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I had a podcast not uh, too long ago talking about ECMO and uh, and the relationship between the emergency department and the interventional cardiologist working with uh, with ECMO. And and I'm seeing a pattern start to develop here uh, that emergency physicians need to really uh, strengthen. And that is their uh, their knowledge of and and relationship with the interventional cardiology team. And uh, and I can see that uh, um, Dr. Matthews is a good example, and you too are, are are good examples of of that relationship and how that that benefits the the patient, and and uh, you're able to offer a level of care that is probably not available in a lot of a lot of places. So I, I congratulate you on that. I I, I want to um, ask you just give me a a case study or or two of of, of a COVID patient. Uh, that came in with uh, PE and and uh, and how that worked. Yeah, I, I mean, I can uh, uh, talk a little bit about that. We, you know, it's interesting. We always talk about the uh, the low risk COVID patients uh, ending up with VT events, and obviously, most of those kind of cases uh, tend to progress just like your your standard uh, DVT and PE patients for the most part. So. They're not necessarily as high risk, but they're just more events. You know, especially we saw a, a, a pretty big surge, I think, in cases uh, where we were actually doing almost some type of VTE therapy on a daily basis around December, January. So, luckily, you know, with the numbers kind of uh, you know fluctuating a little bit too, we've seen a little bit of a, a downtrend, thankfully, uh, and maybe that's reflective of of uh, some increased herd immunity and plus vaccination in Florida, but. 
Um, definitely, uh, there was a big spike, and I think a lot of my colleagues nationally also reported that as well. But I do recall a particular case that was quite, you know, uh, you know, quite quite fascinating. But you know, this is a patient that essentially, uh, you know, presented uh, with uh, 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 fulminant COVID, and uh, so uh, they were uh, uh, on uh, uh, essentially 100% uh, uh, on rebreather. We were trying not to intubate them. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, because a lot of these patients, obviously, once they're tubed, um, yeah. a lot of times their outcome seems to go downhill, especially with COVID diagnosis. Yeah, it's about but 50%. Also, currently, it's about 50% uh, death rate once they go on a ventilator. Exactly. So we try we tried to do everything we can to not get them to that point. Uh, and then the, that patient uh, uh, was uh, uh, coagulopathic as well, too. So platelet counts uh, only around uh, 30. Uh, INR was elevated. Uh, significant uh, uh, L, uh, LFT abnormalities, so transaminitis, hepatitis, so, uh, you know, really shock liver that was going on. She was on three vasopressors as well, wow. too. Wow. Um, so, uh, it's very, you know, this is a patient that's coming in hot, and, uh, you know, uh, she had, uh, um, you know, really kind of what we would call massive PE as well. So, uh, you know, uh, saddle pulmonary emboli extending to both uh, uh, the uh, the left and the right branches and segmental branches. So this is a patient that, you know, you can't give systemic lytics to. Uh, and um, the, uh, you know, if we, if we had lysed her at the bedside, I think she would have bled in her brain and, and uh, um, or bled elsewhere systemically and it would have been a disaster. So we were able to take that patient to the catheterization lab and uh, it, it was pretty impressive. Uh, you know, we were able to use the Lightning 12 system and remove uh, these clots pretty quickly. Actually, a uh, case actually uh, we were able to do in under an hour. And the goal of therapy in this kind of case is, you know, you're not trying to make it look uh, pretty or perfect. You're trying to uh, significantly reduce the thrombus burden, improve perfusion, and then on top of that, you know, we see a significant drop in the uh, uh, PA pressure sometimes as well, which is actually a good sign that you're actually making. Uh, 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 some effective change there. And, and this patient, when they were in the uh, uh, the lab, their their PA pressures were in the in the, in the mid 60s. Uh, and wow. then uh, uh, and then by the time we had actually removed clot from both sides, the PA pressure was was down over 20 points. So uh, and that, and that PA pressure, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we we I've seen them as high as even on the 90 or 100 millimeters of mercury sometimes with big wow. massive peak. And uh, you know you'll get a 40, 50 percent uh, reduction or more. Um, that's fantastic when you see that. And uh, you know, you know you, you, sometimes even greater. Sometimes we'll normalize their PA pressures on the table. So um, I think that um, um, uh, that uh, uh, it, it's pretty amazing to see that. But more importantly, see them uh, improve significantly. And there, uh, in this particular patient, uh, their vasopressor requirements came way down. And on top of that, too, oxygenation improved significantly on the table. You know, what was challenging about this particular case is just the coagulopathy. And, like, how do you manage that? And, uh, you know, we had to do very gentle heparinization for this case, mostly just to not allow for thrombosis while we were doing the catheter thrombectomy procedure. Uh, uh, we couldn't go full bore with the anticoagulation. Uh, but, you know, this patient, uh, you know, did okay, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, it was uh, really the mortality was, risk was very high for this particular uh, uh, scenario. And uh, it's not an uncommon one. We do see these types of coagulopathic patients who come with full COVID. And the fascinating part of it is a, a, a prolonged procedure like that uh, uh, would, if you were losing a lot of blood, would be, that would be a major problem for the patient. Absolutely. And that patient, actually, we were able to do that whole case with about 150 cc's of blood loss. Wow. In the past, uh, when we were to do a procedure like this, too, it could be significantly more. Uh, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, several units of blood, potentially five, 600 cc's. Yeah. Um, so, um, so not only, not only was it important that, uh, that you got in there and did the procedure, but also that you used a, a a technology that allowed you uh, uh, a longer, longer time and, and less blood loss. That's that's fascinating. Uh, that's I think that's a, a nice taste of what's available. I, I think that uh, from an emergency physician standpoint, 
I want to uh, go back to Dr. Raw and and uh, and just talk a little bit about how you developed this relationship and uh, with the endovascular uh, specialist and because you have something that's unique and I think that uh, uh, from the emergency physician standpoint um, you I, I know one of the questions that uh, I would ask if is how do I develop that kind of a program in my hospital I think that's actually a great question because that was going to be one of my wrap-up topics is, is pointing that out for ER physicians. And I think the number one thing is, is really just speaking personally with their interventional cardiologist and involving yourselves in the different hospital committees that pertain to these types of things that can make a difference for our patients. Uh, I, I, I won't go without saying that donuts are a pretty good way of, of breaking bread. <laughs> I think it was, gosh, Dr. Matthews, maybe 10 years ago, probably eight years ago, where yeah. you actually had a speaker come in uh, for the emergency room physicians and, and we actually began talking to us about new, new treatments and thrombectomies. And it was so foreign to each and every one of us. Um, and that kind of got us excited. And then our hospital has been very, very proactive in the last few years in trying to bring in the best technology and you walk through the cath lab and sometimes it looks like, you know, you're on another planet with all the amazing. <laughs> uh, so, so I encourage every ER physician to take a tour of what's really happening outside of your department and just having the, the, the cell phone numbers and the ability to communicate um, with, with the physicians has been spot on. I will also say that our, our team does a really nice job. It's not uncommon that the cath lab directors will put together a report of maybe a timeline of time of arrival to the cath lab and what the culprit problem, or culprit vessels were for, for MIs and what's happening with the pulmonary embolisms, um, and then giving us outcomes for the patient. And you know we're all driven by wanting to do good for the patient. And when you hear that what you did by making a phone call to somebody who has the, the skill to help somebody made such a difference in their outcome is motivating and just looking for that next patient that you can make a difference. And our team's all on board. We, we all love it and have a spectacular relationship that I would encourage any hospital to, to try to make sure that that happens. You know, it, it starts even before you get to the hospital. Uh, if the emergency department has the, <clears throat> the relationship with the uh, pre-hospital providers, and uh, if we can make that a very smooth transition for, uh, for the uh, emergently uh, short of breath patient, uh, the, the, the PE patient, uh, the DVT patient, if we can make that a smooth transition uh, to a, a definitive care, and wow, that is definitely a change in, uh, in paradigm. And uh, I congratulate you both on, on uh, what you're doing down at Manatee Memorial. And uh, I hope that our listeners will uh, think, uh, Think about the way your hospital handles <clears throat> um, pulmonary embolism and uh, DVT. Do you have a Do you have a PERT team? <clears throat> if you don't, uh, maybe you you need to start thinking in, in terms of of, uh, of doing that. And also, particularly with COVID, uh, you know, emphasizing the coagulopathies that we see. Uh, this is only going to uh, uh, only going to get worse. So. Uh, Thank you both for joining me today, and I, I hope this has been beneficial to our uh, listeners, and I, I hope that uh, you all join us again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.